Okay, hello everyone, and thank you all for coming. My name is Dave Rodriguez, and I'm the Director of Business Development at the FreeMind Group. Today I will be presenting non-dilutive funding opportunities for non-US organizations. If you have any questions, of course, about any topic, please feel free at the end of the webinar to send me your questions, and we will try to answer you as, po as soon as possible by mail, okay? Oh, so, so we'll begin, first of all, with a short introduction of the FreeMind Group. FreeMind is a consulting firm, as you well know, specializing in non-dilutive funding. Actually, we're considered by many the global leaders in non-dilutive funding. We've been in the business, business sorry, for about 20 years. Since 1999, we have 72 full-time employees. We work across the life sciences, academics, research institutes, and university medical centers, as well as industry, from small startups all the way up to big pharma and everything in between, from exploratory stage uh, right through to clinical research. And we submit an average of 500 to 550 applications every year, winning awards in over $100 million uh, for the every year on behalf of our clients. Um, well, that's a great deal of experience, knowledge, and expertise, which we put together to increase your chances of winning an award and to help you achieve the largest possible non-dilutive awards possible. Um, a little bit of an explanation on the NIH itself and the different agencies as well. First of all, the most important thing is we're talking about $50 billion allocated annually. Uh, in the health and human services, we have uh, the NIH, which is constituted of 27 institutes and centers, uh, including uh, the NCI. I'll go through a few of the acronyms for you, the National Cancer Institute, NIDDK, National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. And then we've got others, well, I'll just flow through the Neurological Disorders and Stroke, Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, Heart, Lung and uh, Blood, uh, Eye Institute, Mental Health. Also other major agencies we're going to talk about later on as well. Uh, such as ABADA, a Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. Um, we've got the FDA, of course, CDC Center for Disease, and DARPA and DITRA. Um, also, you can see the CDRMRP, which is Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. I'll also mention them later on, and other private foundations. When looking to fund your science, um, we actually strongly recommend pursuing non-dilutive funding as part of your fundraising effort. Um, you can see down at the bottom, this was a 2013 Nature study, The View Beyond Venture Capital, and it's given a few examples of the funding composition of four different companies, while the government organization, which you can see here and represented in orange, uh, actually represents the um, non-dilutive funding agencies, and this is definitely a strategic source among them. So basically, we recommend at least 5% of the effort or time dedicated by your team over uh, given, any given year that should be used to secure non-dilutive funding. Definitely, this should be a strategic source of your funding. Um, when we're looking at uh, the cost of raising capital, it takes money, obviously, to raise money, as you well know. The main message here is that in non-dilutive funding, it's half the time and half the cost. Most importantly, the cost of the capital is equity, as opposed to, well, non-dilutive funding, as you can see, 100% free money that you can be awarded by the government with absolutely no strings attached. I'll explain that later on as well. The importance of uh, non-dilutive funding as we see it here in the market. Here is a study actually taken from the Milken Institute. Uh, non-dilutive funding is benefic beneficial for both agencies and companies. 
The Milken Institute has shown in the study that estimate is called the study is actually called estimating long-term economic returns of the NIH on output in the bioscience that for each dollar that was publicly invested in the R&D, the company may expect to attract an additional 8.38 on average from the private sector over the period of eight years. And every dollar that the government invests in R&D, they will see it back in the future as a $2.3 in economic growth in the US, of course. In other words, the government invests, attracts that government investment attracts additional private investment. For this reason, it actually gains credibility among the private investors. It's a stamp of approval, a recognition from the US government of your actual signs. So this is the reason why um, the, the non-dilutive funding is so important. And the NIH actually do go in, with such a big uh, power into investing in the public investment. Another interesting statistic is that, and this is a little bit of history, historically speaking, 50% of the FDA-approved drugs received government funding at least one time during the course of the R&D stage. Um, what's really important here is the quality of your science. That's what they're actually saying. And just a little bit of an example here, a case study, an interesting example. This uh, is one of our clients, actually. Uh, this recognition is Nano MR Organization. That's their name. This company had two very successful fundraising rounds. Uh, around 2011, they contacted us and asked us to submit a full barter application uh, because they had depleted all their money and they previous, that they previously raised. And their current situation was that either to win a barter award or they were going to go back bankrupt. I'm sure you're aware of that circumstance. And uh, in order to not shut down the company, known as popular in popular terms as a value of death, um, we helped them win and secure a 21 million barter award. And a year later, they were actually acquired by the British DNA Electronics, which... Uh, which then further on went, went to went to win on uh, 50 million, 51 million in a BADA award. The take home message actually here, what I'm trying to say of all these examples is that the government funding is just more than just free money. It actually helps you uh, to increase the value of your company also in the private and the public sector itself. As I mentioned in the beginning, these sources uh, cover everything from discovery stage right through to late phase three clinical trials. From our specific personal knowledge, our clients won awards from $300,000 for very ex exploratory proof of concept early stage projects, up to tens of millions of dollars for more advanced stages. I'll give a few examples further on. Out of the NIH budget, most part is actually used for extramural research, which is money that goes outside the NIH for funding to fund research and development. Here you can actually see the whole bulk, which we're talking about $29 billion itself. The NIH actually covers all of the indications in the life sciences. So no matter what your field of research is, the NIH has money for you. It covers, as you can see, most indications. Just note that this graph reflects spending and not budget, okay? Um, the update of the budget, just for your information, for next year, we're talking about $39 billion. So um, I always get asked uh, this question by our clients, why does the NIH award um, organizations? There are two main reasons. One, uh, the stated mission, of course, is to promote knowledge all over the world, enhance science, and find solutions, of course, for unmet needs. But also the second reason is an economic reason, which I mentioned actually before. Uh, where in addition to contributing to the economic growth of the US, the NIH has found that by infusing 
$39 billion, they actually help reduce the U.S. healthcare expenditure burden, estimated to be or to reach $4.5 trillion in 2019. And also, basically, they want to be, re they want to be the world leaders in innovation as well. Just to emphasize that the NIH is a global investor. This is really a message I want you to take home here. Not geographically driven, but more so invests in good science, ranging from awards given to Canada, uh, all the way down to South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia itself, even the Middle East, Israel, for example. Um, definitely you can win, non-US Alwoodies, Alwoodies have won. This is a little bit of statistics of uh, 2018. Currently, there are 904 awards being paid to non-US applicants, uh, applicant organizations, totaling in $1.3 billion annually. And just to give you an insight of our clients, 30%, one third of our clients of free mind submissions are for non-US applicant organizations. I'm going to discuss the differences between the different um, European sources uh, compared to the non-dilutive funding, okay, such uh, you might know the Horizon 2020 and the U.S. sources I presented so far. Uh, first of all, if you look at the budget allocated to the non-dilutive funding, the Horizon 2020 budget is about 1 billion uh, euros annually in comparison to $50 billion from U.S. sources alone. And if I already mentioned it before, but 39.2 billion uh, from the NIH is going for 2019 alone, and that's just in the NIH. While the Horizon 2020 focuses actually only, as you know, on the economic development aspect, the NIH focuses on promoting knowledge and science all over the world. Uh, finding is open to applicants worldwide. Uh, based totally on science, as I mentioned before, not on geography. And when we're talking about uh, non-dilutive funding, uh, it's about 108%. That would be direct cost of 100% and indirect cost of 8%, uh, which is called also overheads. Again, no strings attached, no equity. And unlike with European sources of funding, no consortium, no IP issues, and no matching funds. Okay, here we're going to talk about um, three of the main funding routes. Um, the solicited address is, is uh, addressed only in a specific area of interest. And if you don't actually find a specific code or indication, um, then you can move on to the second one, which is the open to everyone, which is the unsolicited known also as parent announcements. Investigate your initiate it. Um, and this actually is about 60 to 70 percent of applications uh, that actually go through this route. You present your project, uh, your ideas in the application, and then it's reviewed. And if the idea and the science behind it gets a good score, eventually um, you could go into a relevant institute in the National Institute of Health in the NIH, such as, let's say, oncology related to cancer project will be funded by the NCI, National Cancer Institute, or neuroscience by the NDI, NINDS, okay, or the BA, for example, which is the third and last one, is broad agency announcements which uh, have a much larger scale of funding, but require more advanced stages of clinical research. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the National Institute of Health now, and go a little bit more in detail. This is what you would see if you go into uh, their website. And just an example of what I mentioned before, um, specific solicitations. Um, let's say today there's something about arranging 1,268 solicitations. You can fill in 
your field of interest down where you've got the circle below. And let's say in oncology, for example, and then you get all the specific solicitations that they're related to this field. However, as I said before, if nothing comes up, uh, you can use uh, parent announcements, which is unsolicited, and um, this is a good way to go as well. Um, other examples are the R01 and the R21, the R02. Uh, in order to meet both the R01 for early exploratory or even proof of concept stage and the R21, Around now, it would be a good time to actually start writing the applications and start preparing your submissions. If you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the deadline for submissions would be February the 5th, and for the R21, February the 16th, uh, which actually goes on uh, again, and you can resubmit in June and October itself. Um, you can see the differences in uh, the totals is $300,000 in total and two years for the R21, which is the early stage, as I mentioned before. And the R01 is a little bit later stage, uh, which will go up, of course, to $500,000 direct cost per year, um, totaling $2.7 2 over five-year period. Um, we can see an extensive list of agencies participating in the R21 for early stage development. Uh, the agencies participating in this solicitation are, for example, the, the NIA, National uh, Institute of Aging, uh, the NIAD, uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and uh, also Neurological Diseases and Stroke, and many more. Uh, only just one little mention, except for the NCI, which is the National Cancer Institute, they have their own R21s. Um, specific interest where there is more data or preliminary evidence, also another great number in the and a great number of agencies, as you can see the list here, uh, are participating. And when we're actually looking at different mechanisms, okay, we've talked about agencies, but now we're talking at the mechanisms. There's five main clinical stage funding mechanisms, uh, research project grant, clinical tri uh, trial plan planning grants, research project cooperative agreement, phase cooperative agreement, and which we mentioned before as well, the BAA or the broad agency announcement. Um, but actually, just to give you an update that the NIH uh, has revamped all of these uh, this, this year, so it's going to be a little bit, there's going to be changed, and all of the institutes are using dedicated clinical stage R01, UH2 and UH3, for example. Let's talk about the NIH uh, review process a little bit. And this is really important. Um, first of all, after the application is submitted, there will be an external peer review with experts from the project's fields. They actually ex they examine the risks and the strengths of the application by measuring actually five parameters. Um, whether the project, as you can see, is innovative, does it, uh, it, does it have significance to the public health, um, could your project become a solution for unmet needs? Do you have the right leadership to manage the project? Uh, does your PI have the right expertise? And if you have the right environment, which is not less important, the lab space and tools to support your research. But the most important thing, most importantly, they examine your scientific approach, your specific aims, your goals, and what you want to achieve at the end of the day. So, yeah, what I was saying, at the end of the day, great science actually wins awards. Uh, but it doesn't mean that actually he, your application should just focus on that. In order to score high in these five parameters, you should also know how to write your application, how to present your science in the best way, and you have to make it compelling and very attractive. This is not less important. Um, we're going to approach and look at other sources of funding. Um, BADA, which I actually mentioned a few times before, Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority. 
actually Bader pretty much bridges the um, what what is known as the Valley of Death uh, um, by taking phase one completed projects that have shown, of course, solid preclinical data and have good safety profiles and move them forward. Again, in the areas of um, biological, pandemic inf influenza, and emerging infectious diseases. They usually actually take from phase one, phase two, and on, uh, helping companies actually avoid that so-called valley of death. Let's go further into it. First of all, um, here you can see a clear uh, uh, process of how it works with BADA. First of all, actually BADA is one, probably one of the most welcoming NG agencies. Prior to, to submitting an application, you actually take part in what is known as the TechWatch program. You meet the BADA officers prior to submitting your applications, get some feedback back on your work. It's worth a trip over actually. And I really recommend you get in, t in, you should definitely get in touch with them, try to understand their needs, their interests prior to submit. Now, when you look at BADA and also the Department of the Defense, uh, we'll go into this next. It's usually a three-stage process in comparison to the single submission with the NIH. The first step, as you can see, is the white paper, pre-proposal. Usually it's limited, no more than 10 pages long. Um, the most uh, difficult part is actually to get past this stage, but if you do, within 45 to 90 days, they'll ask you to submit a full proposal, and that's a very good sign, and you'll only have another 45 to 90 days to do so, so you really need to hit the ground and running, and that will then be reviewed for technical merit, and then enter contract negotiations, and if you're there, you probably will you will win and you get you will get that award now um one just a little comment before i go on um while the, the baas typically have no budget cap um you shouldn't go crazy and ask for billion dollars um on the other hand, you should not ask or be afraid to ask for 20 million if justified. So the message here is ask for what you really need. If you ask for too much or too little, they will question if you really know what you're doing. So this is an important message as well. A few other examples of BARDA awards uh, we've had in the past. Uh, this is a company called Basilea, which actually uh, went on to win 89 million dollars from BADA and and actually got to 100 million in the end. The second example is Polynovo um, and Polynovo uh, went to win something like around 26 million from BADA and uh, the important message here is that the, the actual share price went up 300 percent the moment they got um, they got these funds. So uh, non-dilutive funds is also good for business, definitely good for business. Um, actually, I like Carbex. Carbex is a program that includes various agencies, such as the British Welcome Trust, collaborating with BADA, and the NIAID National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which I've mentioned before as well. Uh, it actually provides an accelerator for early stages of development programs. Has been around around two years, proving to be a great source of funding. One of the main scopes, for example, is to find a solution to antibiotic resistance. That's one of them. Um, I said I would actually touch a few other sources of funding. Let's go into the DOD, the Department of Defense, and I mentioned a few of them. DITRA, CDMRP, DARPA. Um, we've got the three um, in the Department of Defense, the DOD, we got three main ones, the DARPA, uh, DITRA, and the U.S. military. And then we've got the CDMRPs, which is the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs which actually go 
sorry, which actually go to um, the, the, the whole idea is for in the army to go with the veterans and the family of the veterans and find cures for their diseases. That's what this is dedicated to. Just another example. Um, the total funding available in each of these programs is extensive. Um, please note, um, actually keep your eyes open um, that the program is issued in this case only once a year, usually during the springtime. So during spring, keep your eyes open for this program. It's a really good program. As you can see, it touches various, various uh, affections and diseases. Some of those breast cancer, general medical research, and you can see the amount of money is given. It's a thing to be taken into account for. And here we can get an example of uh, CDMRP, huge budget for different stages of development. So there's a lot to be accounted for here. Um, but but if we're looking at the topic area for 2018 just, we've got a relatively broad program here, definitely worth looking to, and not related to combat affections as you would actually think when you're thinking of Department of Defense. But also, we touch arthritis, let's look at a few of the list, uh, diabetes, heart disease, influenza, pain, infectious diseases, and many more. Okay, I can go on, but I won't. So basically, we strongly recommend um, that you turn uh, non-dilutive funding into a strategic source of funding. Uh, for sure, our client invests a part of fundraising effort in securing non-dilutive funding in order to maximize the company's funding potential. More than non-dilutive uh, money, it has an added value that I mentioned before that could be translated into additional private investment or even an exit. In the, year, in the near future. So again, you should spend at least 5% of your yearly efforts, efforts sorry, to secure non-dilutive funding, let's say approximately about 100 hours a year of team effort uh, over a year and uh, using, of course, the multi-submission strategy. Um, you should know your weaknesses, definitely. Um, to lower risk, find the right partners, also is necessary. Know the interests of the agency, the mechanism, address non-important administrative aspects, establish yourself both as a top researcher and also an experienced manager. They look at all of this uh, as we went through before. Um, make sure you are qualified specifically for the application and that you have enough data and that you register on time, of course. Um, well, uh, we're coming to the end now. Um, the Free Mind Group, uh, what we do is actually maximize funding potential. First of all, how, how, how do we do it? We first of all identify all relevant funding opportunities. Usually we have a strategist, who most of them are actually PhDs and postdocs, and they actually know all the agencies and contact, know the latest trends and they will actually uh, get the latest and all relevant funding opportunities. And from then we create a multi-submission granting strategy. You'll then work with our consultants who will actually uh, work with uh, the templates, give you templates of the specific solicitations that actually uh, match your science. And that's what's called a multi-submission granting strategy. And the last part would be to submit as many top quality applications as possible. This means that over the question of a year, um, um, if we can do three, four or five applications or even more, the more chances you actually can win one of those awards for us. That is the main thing that we actually do. We'd be very pleased that, for that to happen. Um, we know that uh, companies who have actually submitted more than three or four applications per year have uh, got a 64, more than a 64% chance of winning at least one of those awards. Anyway, um, I hope this um, has been very clear. And if you have any more questions, please, here's my mail. You can send me a, 
an email with your specific questions. I'll get back to you even tomorrow. Uh, also tomorrow we'll send you uh, a download of the presentation itself and also a link will up uh, we'll upload it in the YouTube so you can hear it again if you need to and uh, if you do want to have a chat with me over the phone and go into your specific science um, please do um, just reach out to me through my mail and I'll be here to help so it's been a pleasure being with you and um, and have a good day.